Welcome to Real Jam Radio. I'm Daniel, we're your host, and so happy to have you with us for this episode. Getting close to the start of the NBA season, and I wanted to do, I guess you could call it a season preview podcast. It's its sort of in those lines with Tim Bontemps of the Washington Post. And the basic idea that we started with was, what are you looking forward to this season? And really how both of us as national writers approach the beginning of the season. Because it's hard because you really want to get, get a sense of everybody. So how do you budget your time? And it's something that people have asked me about a little bit for this show and for other things. And so I thought it'd be fun to go through it with Tim, somebody who deals with the same constraints in, in a different way. And fun conversation runs for about an hour. The sponsors for this episode are greats. Brooklyn-based shoe company, absolutely awesome. G-R-E-A-T-S dot com, real GM promo code, 15% off, and our old friends at Blue Apron. Blue Apron, fantastic food delivery service. You go to blueapron.com slash real GM, and you get up to three meals for free, including free shipping on your first order. Definitely check it out. And as I said, the podcast runs about an hour. We talk, cover a lot of ground, talk about a lot of different teams, what we're looking forward to, new guys in new situations, and we argue a little bit about whether LeBron and a few other guys are actually going to go to the Lakers. So Lakers fans can listen. That's towards the end. So lots there to enjoy. Thanks so much for coming on. Anytime, Danny. Happy to do it, man. Looking uh, looking forward to getting started in a week. Yeah, I like that a lot of people are going to be in your in your mentions because of various things when this podcast comes out, and we're probably not going to talk about really any of that. Instead, we're going <laughs> to talk about... Yeah. What I want to start, actually, is something that I don't think we really talk about that much on podcasts, which is really how, as somebody who covers the entire league, and we both do that to varying degrees, you approach the beginning of the season in terms of what you watch, what you're looking forward to, and everything everything like that. So yeah, next week is going to be a little unusual for me. I had originally been planning on being in the Bay Area, going to Warriors Rockets on Tuesday, and then, you know, getting to getting to Sacramento. I think they have a game Wednesday or Thursday and kind of checking out a lot of games on TV and kind of getting the lay of the land. But as it so happens, I'm actually going to be doing a tour through the Midwest next week. So I'm going to go, I'm doing uh, Celtics Cavs on Tuesday. Then I'm going to go to the Pistons opener in their new arena on Wednesday to see, play, see them play Charlotte. Then I'll be at Cavs, Bucks on Friday, and Spurs, Bulls on Saturday. So, I mean, for me, uh, obviously next week is going to be a little unusual because I'm going to be bouncing around to uh, a lot of different places and seeing a lot of people in person all at once. But I think really over the first two or three weeks of the season, what I try to do is to try to just get a general sense of where everybody's at. Anybody in, in the position I'm in who's spent the summer kind of looking ahead at what's going to happen and kind of prognosticating what certain teams are going to look like and how they're going to do and, you know, how rotations are going to play out, all of that kind of stuff. When you get into the start of the regular season, it's your first chance to really start to see if your initial preconceived notions about these teams are accurate or not. You know, sometimes you can watch for a couple weeks and you can go, you know what, this team looks exactly like I thought it was going to be. Or you can look at it and go, you know what, this team or this player uh, is is got a chance to be a lot different than I thought, either in a good way or a bad way. So, you know, to me, you look at like the Timberwolves, right? They had Jimmy Butler to their mix. What do they look like early in the season? Do him and Andrew Wiggins look like they're meshing well in the wing? that kind of stuff. You look at Boston, they have a million new pieces. How do they look? Do they look like they're going to need two months to get everything sorted out? Or are they going to be ready to go, you know, right away and look like a really good team? To me, it's just kind of looking around the league and trying to get a sense of where everybody is and where they are in relation to what I thought they were going to be. So then you could start to really start digging into, okay, this team looks different than I thought. Why is that? Or this player has taken a big leap. Why? What are they doing differently? So I guess it's a long-winded way of, of kind of looking, at least from my perspective, how I try to, to take these first few weeks of the season to, to get a, a handle on how everybody's doing. That makes a lot of sense. Mine is pretty similar to that. And the basic tenet of it is you never get a, a chance to see these teams for the first time again. You know, like the first game yes. for the Rockets. Like, if you don't watch that game live, you can experience it on tape, but it's going to be influenced by what everybody else said. It's going to be influenced by everything. So... I focus a lot on those teams, but you also have to take that with a grain of salt, understanding that you're watching that as a one-off. You're not watching it as like, this is definitive in terms of where they are going as a team or what they're going to be in April. That's not really what it is. It's more just to get that sense. And so for me, the big teams on that list are Houston, Oklahoma City, and Philadelphia. 
because, you know, first game for Fultz and Simmons, and, you know, we'll see what, what Embiid's situation is and all that kind of stuff. And then, of course, the Rockets. The Rockets, to me, are the most interesting team in the league right now because the forces that are in play there are just different. And then Oklahoma City, I, I've been pretty public with saying that my expectation is that this is a one-off for this trio. Whether it's two of them come back is another question. And so I'm going to appreciate the beginning of this because you don't know if it's going to continue. Yeah, no, I didn't even bring up Oklahoma City before. But, yeah, I mean, they're they're going to be fascinating to see how those guys fit together. You've got the, like I mentioned, with the Wolves, you got the Rockets, Chris Paul and James Harden. You know, the Celtics are obviously going to be interesting. Um, the Cavs are going to be interesting. I mean, yeah, I mean, and those are just the teams at the top. You go down the league. I mean, there's just there's going to be a lot to, to look at and figure out. And like you said, you kind of want to I like to try to get a chance to see every team in the league over the first three or four weeks, at least once. Even if it's just watching a condensed game on League Pass, like I like to try to at least see everybody play one time and at least get an idea of, OK, this is what they look like in this early part of the season. And then, you know, you look at stats and you start to circle back to stuff if you find stuff that looks interesting. But like you said, I kind of want to get a first impression of every team and see where they're at. And then I can start to form opinions for what they're going to look like based off of that. What makes this year different to me, at least, is that. Almost every team has a reason why I'm really interested in them at the start of the year. That could be a young player, like let's say Miles Turner, who I think could make a big jump. That could be an overall scheme, not really a coaching change because no coach has changed, but like an overall shift, like what's going on with the Knicks. You know, like everybody really has a hook at the beginning of the year. Now, because of injuries and because of varying other factors, that will change over the course of the year. There will be teams that become unwatchable. I think back to the last two months of the Suns. You know, those sorts of things, those happen. <laughs> yes. But at the beginning yes. of the season, almost everybody is wa- is watchable, and that is really exciting. So, yeah, my goal is to watch at least a half of everybody in the first two weeks. I don't know if I'm going to do it, but that's my goal. Yeah, no, I, I think that's good because, like you, like you said, you want to you wanna try to get a baseline for everybody. And as you were talking, I was trying to think of if there's a team in the league that I don't have something I want to see about them. I, I actually don't think I have an answer for that off the top of my head. I well, think I can come up with something about every single team that I'm interested to see how it goes. To me, the closest is probably the Bulls at the start of the year because they're not going to have... Uh, you know what? Let me let me, let me me revise that. Uh, there's two teams I don't want to see, the Hawks and the Bulls. I have no interest in watching either of them at all. The I know Haw- I'm going to a Bulls game next week, but I, I don't I don't need to see either of those teams do anything. Also, I'll say the difference for me with the Hawks is just, A, John Collins is fascinating to me, so I'm going to keep an eye on him, though that might be... Be, he might be more of like a like a synergy guy where I, wa- I watch more like his isolated stuff and not the team. Yeah, I'm, I'm more curious to see what Utah, what Utah, what Atlanta and Chicago look like in three months when Levine is playing again, presumably, and Collins has got a bigger role in the rotation because I think now he's probably not going to play. But I, I mean, in the short term, I don't need to watch a Dwayne Dedman, Dennis Schroeder pick and roll. And I, I don't need to see anything that Chicago is doing. No offense to anybody in Chicago. Well, and, and that's the point is like, for me, it's it's largely about where there's exploration. Like that's really what the beginning of the season is about. And it's why I get right. so excited. And it's actually why I periodically watch the preseason now when I used to, I used to be really skeptical of it because you get a lot of false positives might be, not be the right word for it, but you get a lot of information that might not be probative. And so I used to be really dubious of that, but now it's kind of, I've gotten a better calibrator for myself of what belongs and not getting on the Kyle Kuzma is going to be a hall of fame player train just yet, just yet, you know, maybe if it lasts another month, we'll see, we'll see. But I I think that it's those sorts of angles of this are going to be fun. And also because we had a couple of disappointing draft classes in the recent past, it's going to be about. Who breaks out, you know, because inevitably, like some people have talked about, you know, oh, Chris Dunn was looking better. No reason to write him off. And that's totally true. You never want to write off a guy after a first year, especially a point guard. But also guys like Aaron Gordon, like is Aaron Gordon going to look more like what we thought he was going to be now that he's playing power forward full time? Or is he just not as good as we thought he might be? And, and, And the hopes with that and those type of players are just all over the floor. I'm really disappointed that we're not going to see Dante Exum because Exum was another one of those guys for me. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, look, if Aaron Gordon, Aaron Gordon, the second half of last year playing a power forward was very good. If he's going to play a power forward again this year, which looks like he's going to, if he can play like he did over the second half, and I want to say he averaged something like 16 and nine and filled up the other stack categories. I mean, if he can, if he can play like that over the course of 82 games at power forward, all right, like then you're talking about a real player. If he can, then you're four years into his career. You don't really know what position he is. You don't really know 
what his role is. And then you kind of wonder, all right, is this guy just going to bust out despite his athletic gifts? And yeah, I mean, you're right. There's a lot of guys like that all over the place that are, are going to make for what I think is going to be a really fun and exciting season that to your point, you know, you can find at least one thing like that on just about every team. I mean, I, I think Atlanta and Chicago are going to be particularly dreadful, but still, if you're talking that you can find something to be excited about on 28 of the 30 teams, and I'll even be looking forward to seeing what, you know, like you said, I'm intrigued by Collins and when Levine is healthy, like Levine is the number one option on the team. I am, I am curious to see how that goes. So even later in the year, I think I can find stuff with those two teams that I'm interested in. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's a pretty good situation for the league to be in when you can look at 90% or more of the teams and say, Hey, I'm excited to watch that for X, Y, or Z. I wrote a piece for the athletic Chicago last week about Levine, a potential extension with him. His situation is so complicated because of the risk involved on both sides. And something I said in that was it's always intriguing to see how a player handles becoming the true number one option and Levine is getting into that at the same point where he's going to be coming onto a team mid like not at the beginning of the season coming back from an injury and like on a totally different team in a totally different city like that that situation when he comes back is going to be really worth watching and another one like that sort of like that is Milwaukee so what Milwaukee you're kind of getting into this realm because I actually think that from a overall scheme perspective a starting five of, of Brogdon, Snell, Middleton, and Giannis, those guys, and then whoever they want to do at center, have they can run that rotation how they want. That actually makes more sense than Jabari in some ways, even though I think Jabari is a superior player to at least Tony Snell of that group. And so how they handle that in the time when Jabari is not an option, and then how does that affect when Jabari comes back, which is probably going to be February or March? Yeah, that will be interesting to see. I mean, I, he's, I, as far as I know from my reporting, he's not going to be back till at least February uh, minimum. The thing that will probably work out for both those guys in terms of coming back, especially in Jabari's case, Levine will too at first. You know, my guess is that they don't really feature Levine as a number one option for a while. Like, I don't I don't think he's going to come back in February or January and play 35 minutes and shoot the ball 20 times. My guess is it probably comes off the bench and gets 15 minutes a night or so, and they, like, ramp him up over time. And given, given, like you said, the situation in Milwaukee with their starting lineup being fairly set with what they've got, I think they have the ability to go to Jabari and say, look, listen, Jabari, let's have you come off the bench and be a six man and play, you know, four minutes at the end of the first quarter, four minutes at the end of the start of the second quarter. Then the same thing with the third and fourth and kind of ease your way back into playing and get your body right. And then, you know, we can go from there. And I think they have that luxury, both those situations, Milwaukee, because they have a roster that you can justify to him is going to have a set starting five when he gets back and Chicago, just because they're going to be God awful and they're not going anywhere. I think it'll make it a little easier for those guys to say, all right, let's ease you both back in and kind of get your legs under you instead of just throwing them into the deep end and having them try to figure it out in a situation where maybe it does put a little more stress on them than you would want. And the extension possibilities do weigh on this in either way, because they'll be sitting there going, well, if I don't have an extension, then I'm doing that. But also there's a difference in terms of trust. Like, I mean, Levine knows that they just gave up a bunch of assets to get him. And I think he might be a little bit more confident in his market. But Jabari, I mean, it seems like he has a lot of belief in himself and how much he's going to get. So we'll have to see, with, especially with this weird class. I mean, we, we're we recording this a little while after Andrew Wiggins signed, but that's not any bit of a surprise. But let's talk briefly about Embiid. We still don't know all the details. There has been some good reporting from Woj and Bobby Marks about the specifics of this deal. You and I have not discussed this one word before we recorded the podcast. How are you feeling about this? It's kind of hard to know. I mean, I wrote a column for the Washington Post earlier this week about it after after it was agreed to. And I, I mean, for me, I just don't quite understand why Philadelphia did it. It's obviously a complex contract. I understand they can release them essentially at the end of, I think, you know, years two, three and four of the deal and get out of it without a, a huge financial penalty on their end. But I just don't really get why they would do it. I think if Joel Embiid got hurt again this season or played 35, 40 games again this season, was there going to be another team that was really going to offer him three or four year fully guaranteed max? I just can't see that, especially when you look around the league and nobody has cap space. So in a situation where so little of the league has cap space and there are so many teams that are facing the tax, is there was there going to be a team that was going to turn around and offer him 
130 or 110 or 20 or 30 million dollars fully guaranteed to try to make it hard on the Sixers not to keep him. I, I just can't see that. And if he was healthy, you could just offer him a five year max then and you would have him. So to me, given the fact that guys only played 30 games in his career, I just don't really understand why they would turn around and offer him a full max now, especially when it does. I know they have ways to add up some more space next summer, but it does cut into their cap space next summer too, which I'm sure going to go try to get another wing to go with the core they have. So I understand to a degree why they did it uh, to keep him happy. He's an important part of their team. Guys there adore him. Uh, the fans there adore him. You know, keeping him part of the fold and making him the face of your franchise. I totally get that. Obviously, they know his financial or his health situation better than me uh, right now. He's supposed to play, I think, tonight, Wednesday, we're recording this. I think he's playing tonight in Brooklyn against the Nets. Uh, or maybe it's a Long Island, but they're, they're playing against, I think he's going to play against the Nets in their, in their preseason game. So, you know, he must feel good about his health from that standpoint. And listen, I, I don't think anybody would, from a talent standpoint, Joel is a max player. And if he's healthy, 100% deserving of every dollar because he, he's got the chance to be a truly special player. I, I just think it's a risk that from my standpoint, it doesn't really, I don't really understand why they decided that they had to do it now, even though they were able to get a contract that was fairly fair to them in terms of some of the, the clauses in it to this point. The way that I want to phrase this is actually a way that I did. I was on the Wolves Wired podcast talking about Wiggins before that signing happened. And I said, what I think teams are, are underappreciating now is that the worst case scenario for a guy as good as Wiggins or Embiid, and this is one of the few things they're similar. I mean, Wiggins has, has played a lot more than Embiid has, obviously, is the idea of the worst case scenario. So let's say... Embiid is, is like from a contract perspective. Obviously, there are worst case scenarios involving his health, and those matter too. But from right. a contract perspective, the worst case that happens is is presumably a three plus one, so three years plus a player option at the max that another team can offer, maybe with some sort of signing bonus fully guaranteed. Yeah, that's that's not a great contract for the Sixers, but it's not terrible, and they would have the ability to get a designated veteran extension on the end of that if he was doing really well. Like, if they wanted to, and, I mean, now we're four for four. We'll see what we are at that point in terms of guys taking that money when that money is available. So that worst-case scenario was not that bad. They didn't fix the rest of the extension system, so that might be a little bit of an issue. And if he's not worth this contract, they have eventual protection in specific circumstances, which is one of the things I found most surprising and interesting about the contract, is that it's not broad, like, oh, if he misses... 25 games it seems like it's more if he misses 25 games and it's because of these things which is actually way stronger protection for Embiid a guy who misses time just because they're being cautious with him and everything else so it's this weird combination where I think his talent is absolutely worth this but the choice to do it now especially when in this specific circumstance you get the benefit of the doubt. This is not a circumstance where it's, you know, trying to be too cute, look at what he's done for you and all that kind of stuff. He's played in 31 games. He could have played in more last year. It's not like he can be pissed at you for saying, hey, we can't come to an agreement right now because we don't know how much you're going to play. Yeah, and I, I think, I even think that the Wiggins situation is different, right? I'm with you. I think generally that to this point, Wiggins has not shown that he is a max player. Um, but you look at Minnesota, a team that already lost Kevin Love because they, they screwed around with his contract completely unnecessarily. They have him and Carl Towns there. They traded Levine for Jimmy Butler. They have this team that's built around these two young guys that they brought in these vets to try to support them with. And Wiggins has been healthy and has been productive, at least from a scoring standpoint. So I can, I can understand why Minnesota would make this bet. Now, Wiggins needs to take, to me, a significant jump to completely merit the money. Uh, but I can understand why they did it. I think your, your rationale about the, the Sixers is spot on, though. And the way I look at them, to your point, the worst case scenario here, to me, wasn't bad enough to avoid signing this. And this isn't a guy like, say, Carl Towns or even a guy like Porzingis that has played a lot through his first couple of years. Not that they're eligible for another year, but those are two guys that you see how they've played and they've been available. You go, okay, these are guys that we, for the long term, want to build around for sure. And Bede, obviously, from a talent standpoint, is right in the same category as those guys. But when you've averaged 10 games a season in your NBA career to then get a max contract for five years uh, a year early is just to me, like you said, it's a, it's a risk that I personally wouldn't have been willing to take. 
Tim and I still have a lot to talk about, but I wanted to tell you all about Greats, a sponsor that I'm thrilled to have a part of the show. And I had a, a great experience actually today with the shoes. So I, I was going to get my hair cut and I wore the great shoes that I have, which are the Royales in the Nero color. So it's a black main part of the shoe with a kind of a white sole and a white frame on it. And without any prompting, my, my hair is just like, wow, those are really cool. Where did you get those? And I got to explain they're greats, they're a sponsor, and that they're a really distinctive look. I think that's part of the reason why I like them why I like them a lot. And since those are, are black and white, it's a color combination that looks good with a lot of different different things. I've really enjoyed them. And so beyond the look, and the look of them is, is very nice, and they have a lot of different styles and versatile, so whatever you're looking for, is that they're also extremely comfortable. They're some of the most comfortable shoes that I've had. They're made of a beautiful leather and the sole is nice, and so I've been using them as I've been walking around the last few weeks, and I love that combination of something that looks cool, that looks distinct, and that you feels good to wear them. And you can check it out for yourself, greats.com, G-R-E-A-T-S.com, and then the Real GM promo code gives you 15% off at checkout. And they're Brooklyn's first sneaker company. They sell classic styles, made the best for less, and they really are nice shoes. And yeah, men's, women's, whatever you're looking for, lots of colors, lots of options. So go through it, spend some time and, and really look at everything they have to offer. I am highly a fan of the, sh- of the shoes that I have, the Royals with the Nero, I think is the color that they have. And you'll find something you like. And again, you get 15% off if you use the Real GM promo code and it's greats.com, G-R-E-A-T-S.com. So we can move on from the from those guys into kind of the broader scope thing with the rest of the league. And you talked about the idea of kind of the teams that are going to take a while. And that's actually why I'm probably not going to focus too much on Cleveland at the beginning of the season. I will still watch them, of course. And LeBron is one of my favorite players in the entire league. And there is still entry because even before Isaiah gets back, they're still incorporating Jay Crowder. They're still dealing with two players on a team that made the NBA Finals the last three years coming off the bench, which is a wild chemistry issue that I think they're, they're, they might have to deal with at some point. But the other team is the, the team that finished ahead of them in the Eastern Conference last year, the Boston Celtics. And the Celtics, to me, the reason I'm going to start watching them from the beginning is I think that they're going to have this core together for a long time. And so they fit in more with the Houston group where I just want to see how this story starts. Yeah, and I actually think they're not going to be that good. And when I say not that good, I don't think they're going to win 30 games like or something like that. But I, I have real questions about what they've done this summer. Very talented player, also has never had a year as good as Isaiah Thomas had. They don't really have any depth in the backcourt now. They don't really have any depth in the front court now at center, which I know people don't really think is that important a position anymore, but you still need big guys that can play on your team. And they have Al Horford and Aaron Baines. I still don't know exactly how bad this knee sprain Aaron Baines suffered the other night was, but those are the only two bigs on the roster. Everybody else they have is essentially a 6'8 combo guy, which, yeah, it's nice to have a bunch of 6'8 combo guys on your team, but they don't really have anybody that can slot in as a natural two guard on the wing. They don't really have anybody that's a true point guard on the roster. I, mean, I, I don't really personally think Marcus Smart's a point guard. He's kind of a combo. Terry Rogier is a combo guard. I actually think Kyrie Irving is a combo guard. I really don't look at him as a point guard as much as he says he wants to be one. He's never really shown any interest in actually being one. I just think their roster is very odd, oddly constructed, and I think they're probably going to struggle on defense. They could struggle with spacing if guys like Smart don't take a step, if Jalen Brown can't shoot the ball. Marcus Morris is an okay shooter at power forward, but you know, not not exactly a reliable three-point shooter. He's more of a guy who likes to shoot from 16 feet. They have talent, and I, I do think that, like you said, this clearly is the start of something, and I think like long-term, you have to like where they're at, both with the picks they have coming in and uh, the talent they already have. But I think there's going to be a lot of growing pains this year, and I'm not I'm not just automatically writing them in for 50 plus wins like a lot of people are. I mean, to me, from an over under standpoint, I know you did you know you've either gone through most of them with Nate or you're going to uh, on his podcast. But I uh, to me, one of the locks of the year, at least in my book, is is under on the Celtics at 55 wins. I just think that's a crazy high number for a team that has to go through as many changes as they do. And there are changes that you can't paper over you can't smooth over because it's such a different roster and there's no continuity basically everybody changed over and they're all players that don't have continuity with each other or the system so sure Gordon Hayward you know maybe his role is going to be similar to what his role was in Utah at certain elements but he's on a completely different team in a completely different city and the Boston offense and the Utah offense are not the same like all of those things are going to take time 
And that doesn't mean that the Celtics are doomed or anything like that. It just means that this is a long play, and the beginning of that long play matters, but it could be rocky. Think about it this way. Four guys out of the starting lineup are new. Yeah. Like, new in that they replace guys that are still on the team. The four of their five starters off a team that won 53 games not on the team anymore. So, I mean, the, the biggest thing that points, to, that points to success in the NBA is continuity. Not even necessarily with the coaching staff, but with players. Like, you go back and look last year at the teams that were really good. And obviously, you know, Golden State added Kevin Durant, which was a big change for them. But, you know, you look, San Antonio didn't really add anybody new. Houston didn't, you know, they added Eric Gordon and Ryan Anderson. But the rest of those guys had all been there. And, you know, James Harden was was back to being right again. Like, most of those guys were there. You look at the, the Celtics had virtually everybody back from the year before. The Cavs had virtually everybody back from the year before. The Wizards had virtually everybody back from the year before. Generally, if you have everybody there and you know what everybody's going to do, you're going to be better off. And so, yeah, like, I, to your point, not saying the Celtics are permanently done for, not saying they're not even more talented than last year. It's saying not necessarily be conference finals again. I think people are expecting them to come out the gate flying. You know, I just think they're going to have a, a lot of growing pains to try to get a lot of new pieces acclimated into, like what you said, is a totally different system. I mean, Kyrie Irving and Cleveland, they don't really run a lot of stuff. Now in Boston, they want to run all this stuff. Is he going to be willing to be a point guard? You know, Gordon Hayward's going to be in a different system than before, even if he's with the coach he's used to. You know, all those guys have to make big adjustments. They're going to be relying on Jason Tatum and, and Jalen Brown for really big minutes that I think they need to prove they can handle. I mean, there's just a lot a lot to take in there. So, yeah, I'm really excited to watch them play just from, a, you know, being an interested observer of how they develop. And, yeah, I think I think it is going to take them a while to get to the place people think they can just because of the natural progression it takes for teams to get used to playing with one another. They also start their season against a lot of teams that have a lot of continuity. So Cleveland doesn't, but Cleveland is also really good. They play Milwaukee twice. They play Miami and San Antonio all in the first three weeks of the season. You know, those teams are pretty much the same as they were before, at least yeah, to a large a lot. point. That's a tough that's a tough opening So like sure. yeah, yeah, they'll they'll spike the Knicks and the they probably will beat the Sixers because you know, the Sixers might end up being good by the end of the year, but they have a lot of turnover themselves and they're relying on guys that haven't played in the NBA. You see that and then they play OKC relatively early on. And it's, it's like, you know, I, I think that Boston will figure it out. Talent I always assume that talent wins out in the league. I've been asked that about the Wolves, and that's kind of my feeling with them too. But it it does take time. And so who you play early does matter and that's also one of the big overarching stories for me of this year is the combination of the uncertainty around the playoff picture and the earlier trade deadline there there will be a line in the sand that's going to be a little bit different for each team but generally speaking teams are going to say am i in contention or am i not in contention but let's say in the East, if it, especially now that Charlotte's going to be without Batum for a little while, if teams like Indiana are saying, hey, we can still make it in, that completely changes the trade deadline because it's so much earlier than if it were after the All-Star break and if the and if there was a greater disparity. And you could use the West maybe as a caliber here because, you know, if it's looking like it's going to take mid-40s to get in in the West, a lot of teams are just going to go, well, we can't go in. And that might actually lead to even more disparity moving forward because if the West teams tank first, then that actually makes them better long term in what everybody says is going to be a good draft class. Yeah, no, like that that's all going to be interesting. I mean, you, you have to sit and wonder, like, you know, I, I think you can even also look at it the other way, where if a team, because of the earlier deadline, you might see a team that's on the verge of on the, the fringes of making the playoffs that goes, you know what, we don't really think we can do this. Or if we do do this, we're just going to get destroyed in the first round. And so let's, you know, kind of like what the Minnesota Twins did in baseball. The Twins decided in late July they couldn't make the playoffs. And so they they made a trade. They had a rough week. And then they actually traded the guy they traded for a week later to the Yankees of all teams who they had lost to in the playoffs and, and said, we're just going to play our young guys. Well, then their young guys went crazy and they ended up making the playoffs anyway by having an insane two months. And I... I almost wonder if we act like if you're a team like, say, Indiana, like you mentioned, well, if they're looking at it and they're like, th say, maybe three or four game playoff spot in mid-January, maybe they go, you know what, maybe we'll make the playoffs or maybe we won't, but let's trade Thad Young for whatever we can get and we'll play TJ Leaf and 
Who knows? Maybe TJ Leaf is Ryan Anderson, right? Maybe he's a young Ryan Anderson. It's three threes a game. They go on a hot streak and maybe they make the playoffs down the road. I think you could see teams kind of decide to pull the plug earlier just because they'd rather take a chance on definitely getting something and then maybe getting hot and making a run at a playoff spot. That might marginally help them get closer to the playoffs, but you know, if they're, but if they're not sure they can make it, this game not making the playoffs, but that's for nothing as a free agent. Another factor in that whole equation for some of these teams, and Indiana is a good reflection of this, so is Sacramento, is whether they're on the precipice of cap space or not. Because certain teams are like, you know, like the Lakers, they're going to do what they're doing in regards to cap space. They're not going to focus on anything else. But the right. Bulls and the Pacers and the Kings, I think those three teams, the Suns could be here too. They, they have some real give here. They can go in a lot of different directions. Utah is actually another one of those teams. And so how they approach what happens to them this season is going to be important, not only for them, but for all the teams that are interested in their guys. So how that all works out. And also we talked to what you mentioned before, and I just wrote a piece for the sporting news that came out this morning, a uh, morning on, on Wednesday about like basically how few teams are going to have a lot of space this year. How does, how does that approach it? And then how does that also affect this avalanche of guys that have player options for next year. So Sacramento and, and Indiana are actually the two biggest teams that I can think of for this, where Sacramento has Costa Cufos and, and Garrett Temple, and Indiana has Thad Young and Corey Joseph. If those guys opt into their contracts, then the flexibility for them goes down a lot, even though you might say those guys are good values just because they're so spooked by the market. Yeah, I would say that the Sacramento guys opt in and the Indiana guys opt out. Personally, that would be my two cents on it. I would think Corey, you know, Corey's a, a guy in his mid twenties. I, I think he'd get a pretty good deal to be a backup point guard somewhere at minimum. Maybe, maybe he has a terrible year and that changes. But to me, him and Thad Young both would opt out. I mean, I, I think Thad could get at least the same money, even in, in, even in this marketplace. He's a serviceable, solid power forward. He's a switchable guy. He could play, he could help you play small. I, I think there's enough teams. Even if he got a four-year deal at the mid-level, you're still not talking a huge pay cut from where he's at now to lock in for four more years. I think he's more likely to opt out. I, I think the guys the guys in, in uh, Sacramento, to me, both are more likely to opt in. And you're right, that does that does really impact the calculus for what you're doing, especially when you have a roster that, you know, like in Sacramento, they've got what, 10 or 11 guys under 24 on the team. So, you know, if you don't have that many open roster spots to begin with and you have guys you may be uh, anticipating opting out, opting in, that's certainly going to impact how you're trying to build your team out over the next year or two. Yeah, that's going to be a big factor. And another story that I want to watch this year, and this came up a little bit in the space race piece, and I'm going to do a new one of those once we have all the extension numbers in, which is basically, so there's about, it was $400 million, which was the same as last year. Now it's getting closer to $300 million. I haven't done it after the Embiid stuff. In, in available money this offseason, and it's narrowly concentrated, as, as we've talked about a little bit. But another big part of it that's different this year is that a lot of the free agents actually are concentrated on teams that even if they lose that guy, they're not really going to be teams that have money to work with. For example, Isaiah Thomas, LeBron James with Cleveland, or DeMarcus Cousins on the Pelicans. If those guys leave, it's not like those spots are opening up. It's not like the Pelicans can go, hey, we now have a max spot. We can go after somebody else. Nope, they still don't have cap space. They can't do that. And so it's possible that this is going to dry up so fast. Yeah, no, I think so too. And I, I mean, it's even less than 300 million, isn't it? I mean, it's got to be, I think at this point, it's got to be somewhere in the range of $250 million, I would think. And that, and that's even before you factor in some more of these extension guys. I mean, if, if Zach Levine signs an extension, that's a chunk of money that's not on the board. I don't think Levine will sign an extension personally, but, but if he does, there's a chunk of money that's off the board. If Drew Barry signs an extension, there's some money that could be off the board. Kind of, you kind of look around. Uh, the league and there's just, there isn't a lot of money on the market and you know, it's hard to see where it's going to come from. And it, to me, it, it is going to be really, really interesting to see how that all shakes out and, and how I think that's why you see right now a lot of these guys are taking extensions because I think, you know, for the same reason you said, well, maybe these, these guys will consider opting into their contracts. I think a lot of these agents and players are looking at the market and going, Hey, we have no idea how much money is going to be available. So rather than risk it and potentially put ourselves in a bad spot uh, where we maybe don't have any money to play with on July 3rd, we'll just take this what we can get right now and then we'll worry about the rest later. 
Yeah, that could definitely be true. And also, like, I think about that even in terms of somebody like Yusuf Nurkic, who's who's probably really believing in himself and thinks that he's going to have a good year. He missed the end of last season with that leg injury. But who's going to give him that money? Like, who's sitting there going, hey, we have $20 million, $25 million, and Yusuf Nurkic is how we want to do it. Yes, it's true that the Blazers were that troll with Ennis Kanter years ago, but I'm not sure that there is a Blazers like that anymore. Yeah, no, I mean, you have to balance. If you're a team like Portland, right, and you have a guy like Nurkic who has been known to be a bit headstrong, you have to balance, you know, how much do you want to squeeze them and how much do you want to have your locker room be happy, right? And that's a that's a difficult line to walk because, you know, they're a, cat, they're a tax team and you don't want to put yourself in tax hell. But at the same time, you know, if you try, if you go to a guy and you try to say, hey, you might think you're worth 20, but the market can only pay you 12. So here's 13. Like that's, that's not going to sit well with them. Right. So it, it's a fine line for everybody involved to walk, to try to make this all work. And look, a lot of this goes back to the spike, right? Because that spike happened, you had a lot of guys in that certain class make a ton of money. And I think you're going to see in the years after it, a lot of these guys are going to go, Hey, so-and-so got paid 16 or 17 or $18 million a year. Why am I not? And the response is going to be, well, there, that money isn't there. Go find it. And I think that could lead to a lot of disgruntled players too. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is very interesting how, how that all played out and how it's shaping where the league is going right now. The Myers Leonard problem, basically. Yeah. I mean, not just him. I mean, you could, you could say that for guys like Luol Deng and Mozgov, right? Where guys were Evan Turner, you know, I, those are just names. And I even, of even head, but there's like a lot DJ, of guys. DJ Augustine, like DJ Augustine, yeah. not only in terms of the salary per yeah. year, but he got Absolutely. four years. Like DJ Augustine got four years and he wasn't that good to start with. And right. some of that was just, you know, management trying to save their jobs in like one of the stupidest ways possible to throw money at DJ Augustine of all things. But uh, that sort of thing isn't going to happen anymore. There aren't as many reckless contracts. I mean, there will always be a Tim Hardaway Jr. There will always be one or two of those just because that's the way the league works. Right. But, but there it's are... different when there's one of those and when there's 10 of them. Right. And and this year, I, I you know, in 2018, I think that it's going to be, you know, more in that like two to three range. Like that's how many like truly heinous contracts are going to be out there. And it might even be fewer than that if these teams get a little bit get a little bit cautious and start learning what they're doing. And that doesn't mean every team is well run. That doesn't mean every team is well managed. But another factor in all of this, partially weighted by the Tim Hardaway contract, is that a lot of poorly run teams aren't going to have a lot of cap space this year. That's true too. And I mean, and look too, the other thing is like there, you can look and like a large chunk of the available cap space is all concentrated in a couple places too. So like not only, not only are there not a lot of teams that are going to have money if guys leave them, but there's also not a lot of teams that actually have money. So, you know, like Chicago's got a lot of money and LA has got a lot of money, but like if say LeBron decides to stay in Cleveland for another year, which I think is eminently possible, especially if Paul George doesn't go anywhere, which I also think is eminently possible. Then what are those teams going to do with that money? I mean, are they just going to roll it over for a year? Are they going to, you know, do, do the one year deal thing? Are they going to take on, you know, caps, you know, other people's bad contracts for assets? Like, you know, that, that to me is going to be very interesting because you're going to have probably two thirds of the league close to paying the tax. You're going to have a couple teams with a bunch of cap space. And you're going to have everybody else kind of just sitting around uh, waiting to see what's going to happen. It's it's going to make for uh, what I think could be a really jacked up uh, free agency period and a you know a trade market in in the summer with teams trying to maneuver around that and figure out what they're going to do. That's a really good point. And two other elements of that that I've found really fascinating as I've been working on kind of some offseason preview stuff is one, some of the teams that have a lot of space either might not have an interest in high level free agents and high level free agents might not have an interest in them. So like Chicago, you know, it's possible even if they throw money at some of these guys, they're just going to be like, I, is Isaiah Thomas going to go, oh man, I really want to go play for the Bulls. Like that could be a, a really big issue. And then the second one is how does this all all fit together in terms of the potential of expiring contracts? So there aren't that like a lot of the part of the a, a big part of what happened in 2016 was these teams signed really bad contracts for a long time. So there also are not that many terrible expiring contracts. And so I could see, especially after what Brooklyn got to take on Moscow's contract, see these teams going, hey, if you're going to throw long term money at us, we're going to want something serious back. And then being like, well, you know, maybe if you have an expiring contract, we can make that work. And then there just aren't that many expiring contracts. No, exactly. I mean, you know, that that's the thing where like, if you're Indiana, right, and you have Thad Young, would you do Thad Young for Yamahini in a first? 
or just as an example off the top of my head, or, you know, or some other, you know, or would you do, would you do on that same team? Would you do Corey Joseph for Myers Leonard in a first deals like that? I I think that you're going to see a lot of teams trying to make deals like that if they can uh, to try to get off of money. Boyan Bogdanovich, I think he's got 2 million guaranteed on his second year of his deal. You know, there's another guy that, you know, one of these teams trying to shed a contract, maybe they take him, you know, like, like ironically what, what uh, Brooklyn did with, with Bogdanovich la- or, uh, last year, they ship him to Washington, they get a first round pick with Andrew Nicholson, and then they move on Nicholson's deal to take on a better player with a, a bigger contract. I think you could see teams start to get creative with stuff like that because, you know, you're going to have a lot of teams desperate to get off money and by hook or by crook, a lot of them probably are going to do it. And how exactly they go about it will make for some very interesting dynamics around the league. Before we move on to really the end of the podcast, I want to take a minute to tell you about Blue Apron. I'm thrilled to have Blue Apron back on the show because, as many of you know, especially longtime listeners, I'm a huge fan of their product. I've been enjoying Blue Apron now for, I think it's a couple of years, and there are always new standouts. The one for me that was most recent was it was a seared salmon and a tomato. They called it a tomato fondue, but it was really a tomato dish on it, and then there was rice and carrots, and it was excellently cooked. It, it actually reheated well because I get the larger meals, and then you often have more to enjoy it over multiple days. And it was another reminder of a lot of the reasons why I enjoy Blue Apron. One is excellent, high quality ingredients. I'm a particular fan of their seafood, which is surprising because I'm not the biggest fan of seafood, but they do such an amazing job. And it's all very sustainably caught, which matters to me because my sister's a marine biologist. And so she wouldn't let me live it down if I went any other way. But all the other ingredients, whether you're talking more like the, the main pieces, like in that one, the tomatoes and the carrots, or the spices or anything like that. And that's the other reason why Blue Apron is so intriguing for somebody who doesn't have the most fleshed out cabinet in terms of all of the other elements that make for a successful dish. And when you get Blue Apron, you don't have to worry about going to the store, or buying the wrong quantity or anything like that. It's all perfectly portioned for you. So that means A, you don't have any food waste and B, you don't have any purchase waste. If you want to think about it that way, you get exactly what you need to make it happen. And I'm a huge, huge fan of Blue Apron for those reasons. And it's a great way to build cooking confidence and eat eat good food. I mean, you have all of these different things that are running together. I've been using it now for, for years, it feels like, and I absolutely love it. So you can try it out for yourself. The way you do it is you go to blueapron.com slash real GM. So it's a URL and you get up to you get your first 3 meals free including free shipping on your first order and you don't have to take my word for it you can try it out i that's how it happened with me you know they came on as a sponsor i had loose familiarity with the product and now it's hard for me to imagine not having it anymore so again you go to blueapron.com slash real gm get your first three meals for free including free shipping on that first order so blueapron.com slash real gm blue apron a better way to cook the two teams that I kind of want to end this with, I think are one's flying under the radar. One absolutely isn't because I think they're genetically incapable of it. But they're two teams that I think will be really, really fun to watch this year, but also are key to f- keep an eye on going forward. And so the first one I want to talk about is, is the more under the radar one. That's the Dallas Mavericks. Because what Dallas has is an intriguing roster, especially when Seth Curry comes back from his stress reaction. They have all, just a lot of talented guys, and I love Rick Carlisle as a coach. But also, you know, they can get pretty close to max money and Dallas with max money in this market could actually make some noise. I've been thinking about them as a DeMarcus Cousins destination, but they could get in on just about anybody. They would make a lot of sense for DeMarcus. And and you look too, and they're a team where, you know, you look at these guys that are looking at free agency, right? And you look at a guy like Dennis Smith Jr., and I think he's going to be really good. If he wins rookie of the year or maybe finishes second or third in the rank in the voting and looks really talented and like a promising guy to build around going forward. And you've got Rick Carlisle and you've got uh, Harrison Barnes, who looks like a nice piece. You've got some other guys there, some younger guys, Seth Curry, some other guys that maybe you can look at and say these guys could be pieces of something. You know, I, I think you look at that and you say, hey, you know, that's a team that I could go to that's got a good infrastructure. It's got a good owner that's got smart management, and a good coach. 
you know, I could see, I think you're right. I think they become a team that even though they didn't have those other guys, the fact that they've got a young guy, they'll probably be bad enough to have another top 10 pick and which should be a pretty good draft, maybe higher if they get lucky. You know, I think that puts you in a situation where you can really start to put the pieces together and have a team that a guy like Boogie might look at and go, hey, you know what? That'd be a good place to go. And then as time moves on, they'll still have, they can still create more money to go get more guys and build it around me over time. So yeah, I, I think, I think they are a really interesting destination in there. They're, I think going to be a fun team to watch because I, if, if people, I imagine anybody listening to this podcast has already knows all about Dennis Smith, but he is going to be, I think a really, really fun player to watch. And, a guy that you can turn on a game, a you know, random league pass night, and you know Dallas isn't going to be good, and he's going to have plenty of nights where he's all over the place because he's a rookie and he, he's going to be a little out of control. But he's going to have some nights here where he probably goes for 35 points and does some stuff that really makes you drop your jaw and, and you know marvel at what he can do. And Rick Carlisle is the only coach in the league that can deal with an injury to a point guard and still have four, four point guards that can play rotation <laughs> for him and actually do it. And Dallas, yeah. Dallas consistently, the way that they've approached this has been so much fun the last couple of years, giving Curry the chance in the first place, Yogi Ferrell, who might end up starting for this team. They have a lot of different guys there. I'm going to be fascinated with what they do and how they approach that moving forward. And then the team that is the elephant in the room for me in so many ways, and that I think, and, and I've talked about it before, but I'm going to be talking about it this whole year is the Lakers. The Lakers have two different Different things that make them so incredibly important. One is they're going to be amazingly fun to watch this year, and they actually have young players that are that are entertaining. Lonzo is is phenomenal. To watch whether he's going to have up and down days, just like Dennis Smith. And you know maybe Kyle Kuzma is not the next Dirk Nowitzki, but whatever. He's still an intriguing young player. They have a lot of these young players, but the prospect of the Lakers looking good and getting up to two max slots. I get really obsessed with the idea of super teams because super teams are relevant. It's, it's what happens in the post Miami world for me more so than, than what Boston did because what Boston made was kind of out of whole cloth. That's an entirely different thing than what Boston, meaning the KG, not the current team. Right. And the Lakers could do that. I, I'm not sure they will. It's going to depend on what guys like LeBron and Paul George and Chris Paul want to do or the maybe reuniting the whole banana boat or something like that. But this year is going to be fun. How this year impacts next year is going to be fun. And next off season is going to be absolutely bonkers. Yeah, see, I don't, I'm kind of wondering if next off season is going to be very boring. I, I think for the reasons we talked about, I, I I think I think to me the whole key is Paul George. If Paul George decides to stay in Oklahoma City, which I think is a real possibility, I, I look around and I just don't see where anybody's going to go. I mean, yeah, maybe a guy like Demarcus would go to the Lakers or the Mavs or something, but you start to look around and Isaiah Thomas is injured. If LeBron sticks in Cleveland, if the three guys in Oklahoma City stick around there, which I think there's no question Carmelo is staying there now that Russ is locked in. I think it's just a matter of. I shouldn't say no question. I think it's extremely likely Carmelo sticks around. It's a matter of what Paul George does. But, you know, I think if Paul George does stick around, I think you have to look around and kind of wonder, is this going to be the offseason we expected with a lot of craziness happening when there aren't a lot of teams of money and there aren't a lot of there aren't a lot of guys actually thinking about moving? I think it could be more of an offseason for basketball nerds like ourselves, where there is like the much more intriguing stuff is. How are these teams trying to get off of money and like what kind of machinations are they doing to avoid the tax? You know, I think that's what's going to be interesting. I think the Lakers are, are going to be fun to watch. Like you said, I also think they're going to be horrific. Uh, I think they're they're going to be really, really bad. I, I've seen people say they could win 30 or 35 games. I, I think that's crazy. Personally, I, I think they're really going to struggle a lot. You know, they're. People, you know, the, the big talk in L.A. is that they, they have to work on their defense. Their defense, I, I think, is going to be atrocious. I mean, I'm a huge Lonzo fan, just like you are. I know you're a UCLA guy, but, you know, he's going to be very fun to watch. I think he's going to be a very good player, but he's not exactly a great defender. Contavious Paul Pope is good at the two, but, you know, Brandon Ingram still has a lot of work to do to become a really good defender at the three. They don't really have a good power forward defender at the four. Brooke Lopez can block shots, but can't move his feet at all and is a bit of a liability in the f at the five. And if he has to miss any time, which I'm sure he's going to miss some time, you know, guys like Kavika Zubac and, and Bogut at this point, like they just, I just think their defense is going to be terrible. So um, I think they will be very fun. I'm looking forward to watching them. I also think that they're just going to stink. And I think it could very well wind up that the Celtics wind up with that pick, which is protected. Uh, they either It's either outside the top five or if it's a number one pick, it goes to Philly. But I, I think you could see Boston get that pick and give themselves another young guy and what's a loaded top of this draft because I just think that the, the Lakers, for all the excitement about them, understandably, and I, I like the direction they're going in, I, it's hard for me to see how that team gets better uh, in the short term. 
I can't wait for Danny Ainge to take another gritty guard up high. Maybe Colin Sexton can be that guy. <laughs> get that pick. But uh, so, so my, my thing, and I haven't talked to people in the know really about this, but my little theory is that if Paul George says no, I think it's going to be very hard for Chris Paul to say no, because the rocket situation is fungible. It is flexible. But if, if LeBron goes there, and and it's so and LeBron says, "Hey Chris, you can play here with with Lonzo," and I think that actually works. Lonzo playing off ball a little bit more at the two. You talk about a team of CP, LeBron, Lonzo, Brandon Ingram, and probably Brook Lopez at center. That's really hard to say no to in LA, where his family, you know, where Chris Paul's been based for basically the last is, is six it, years. Is it really hard to say no to? Yes. I mean, I see well, why. <laughs> I Do mean, you, why, why, why is Chris Paul? No, seriously, why is Chris Paul? I mean, look, Brandon Ingram was one of the worst players and one of the worst, worst rookies in the history of basketball last year that's from true. a statistical standpoint and Lonzo Ball is 19 like are, is is Chris Paul at 34 at that point or 33 going to be like yeah you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna give away you know the last part of my prime to a team that features uh in that construction two guys are under 21 that I mean look maybe Brandon Ingram takes a big leap this year but if he doesn't take a big leap this year, I don't look at him as a guy that guys like LeBron and Chris Paul are going to go, that guy's a building block. I mean, those guys aren't – LeBron is not going to go to some team that's going to be good three years from now. That's the part about him going to L.A. that I've always been hesitant about is that let's say they can get Paul George and him to go there, okay? They probably have to trade Ingram if he shows anything at all to get rid of Luol Deng. They're not going to have Randall then. So, okay, so you have Lonzo Ball and Kyle Kuzma and – a bare bones roster besides Larry Nance Jr. Like those guys all have potential. And like Nance, I think is a good rotation player now, but I don't look at those guys and say, that's a surefire contender. I mean, it's not like going to the the roster that Thunder had in 2009, where they had three guys under 22 that all look like they could be all-stars. That's why to me, I just, I could see Chris Paul and LeBron teaming up, but I can't see them going, yeah, I want to play with, with these guys that are super young. I mean, even, even when LeBron went to Cleveland, Kyrie was at least 22 or 23 at that point. He was going into his fourth year in the league. He at least was a guy he had won. I think that, I think I'm pretty sure he won the MVP of the all-star game that year before LeBron got there. So like he had, even if you have questions about what he was as a player, he at least had done some stuff that earned him respect in the eyes of players. And you knew they were trading Andrew Wiggins for Kevin Love. And so you, LeBron could go there and say, Hey, they have Tristan Thompson. They've got Kyrie. They're going to have Kevin Love. Like there are, there are vets I could come here and win with right now. And that team, when he got there, you said that team is the best team in the Eastern Conference. If, if you have that grouping, even if they can't keep Brooke Lopez, which frankly, I don't think, I don't know if they could keep Brooke Lopez cap wise and, and sign those guys. How good is that team in the West? I mean, is that team better than if the Oklahoma City team stays together? I mean, are they better than uh, are they better than them? I, I don't think so. Are they better than uh, the Wolves? If the Wolves are good, I, maybe the Spurs are still going to be good, probably because they always are. The Rockets would still be good. Even if they lost Chris Paul, they'd have flexibility to go do something. They, they might be better than them still. Uh, so is LeBron and Chris Paul going to go sign up for a team that's going to be in the middle of the pack in the West? And if it played the Warriors, they'd get destroyed? Personally, I just don't see it. Maybe I'll wind up being completely wrong. But uh, I, I think that I think the Lakers are going to have to do something bigger than that if they're going to get him to go there. And that's why, to me, the key to that is, is Paul George. Because if Paul George isn't willing to go anywhere, I think you're right that it would keep Chris Paul from leaving. And to a degree. And I also think it would really make LeBron think twice about leaving because like if you have LeBron and Paul George and they go to LA and then they want you to turn around and go get Anthony Davis or something like you can trade Lonzo and some other pieces and picks and try to go get a guy like Anthony Davis or some similar type third wheel. Like, okay, then maybe you can do that and construct a team that makes sense. But I just think as currently constructed, I, I just don't see their young guys being enticing enough to get a guy like LeBron or or, or one of those elite guys say, yeah, I'm going to go team up with them right now and, and we're going to be really good immediately. A lot to unpack there, but I think the operating theory is correct. That Le- I, The way that I've been phrasing it is that I don't think LeBron is going to go to a place unless that team has a very good chance of making at the bare minimum the conference finals. You know, like I, right. and you could and you could say the NBA finals, and I wouldn't bat an eye. I wouldn't say that would be incorrect. And he, if he's going to the Western Conference, he's going somewhere where he thinks he has a chance to beat Golden State. 
And so that that raises a real problem because the teams that have cap space, and I also don't think LeBron is going to leave a lot of money on the table. He could leave a little, but I don't think he's going to, you know, go for the go to Houston for the middle level exception or something. I don't think I don't think those options are reasonable, at least to me. Right. So so you're right though that if if he doesn't feel that that Lakers team would be there, then that's an issue. I think that their their cap situation is a little bit different. It depends on whether they're willing to. To me, the big the big mover there is whether they're willing to stretch Wu all day because they could stretch him and drop that number by a little more than ten million, and then you're getting kind of close to where you need to be, especially if they let Randall go, which they probably would. So they can get close. But you're right that the team is, is, it is going to be young. It is going to be different. And it really is all about present competitiveness rather than future competitiveness. Because for CP and LeBron, that next like year or two is really what it's all about. So you're right though that that could lead. Chris Paul to go back to Houston just because he's probably not going to get on a better team. But if there's an element of them that, let's say the Warriors run roughshod over this year, that goes, hey, you know, like, especially with LeBron in Cleveland, if they don't want to pay Isaiah, which I think is exceedingly likely, either whether LeBron stays or not, that that they just go, well, you know, maybe that's not going to be what we are, but let's have like a lot of fun in a place that we want to be and give ourselves a reasonably good shot. And maybe that argument works better for Paul George than it does for Chris Paul because he's, you know, from Palmdale, not that far away. Maybe it maybe it speaks more to him. But I, my theory is still that that's going to work. I just think that those two guys in particular are way too competitive. I mean, I think if you I think if you're talking about them at 37, I think that's a different calculus, right? Like, OK, we're definitely past our prime, but we want to go play somewhere and they make it happen where they go play on a team and they screw around and, and like they they you know whatever they have their their fun like I think that's different if they're like decidedly past it right but I, I think LeBron James is focused on his legacy and trying to catch Michael Jordan in every way right and so I, I just I just cannot see him going yeah I'm gonna go have some fun at 33 I think LeBron thinks he can be LeBron till he's 38 now maybe he can't be but I mean, I don't I don't see him until he can't do it anymore. I just don't see him thinking he can't get to the finals. You know that it means a lot to LeBron that he's made seven straight finals. And I, I and it certainly looks like it's going to be eight. And if he doesn't have if he can't go to the L.A. to me with a, a plausible chance of beating Golden State, then I think he looks at everything and says, I should just stay here in Cleveland. We got a really good team again. And then I can reassess in a year and because he can do whatever he wants. Right. Like he's LeBron James. If he says I want to go somewhere, teams will blow up their team to sign him until he isn't LeBron James anymore. So that's why to me, I just think uh, it's fun to think about these combinations of guys. But to me, it's only realistic if you look at it and say this team has a chance. Now, could he and Chris Paul take a little less money to go to L.A. to play with Paul George? Yes. Like, I think then if you're getting Paul George in the mix there, then I think a lot of stuff can happen. Then you've got a couple of guys who can play on the wings. Then all of a sudden things look different. Right. But I, that's why, to me, he, in a way, is the entire key to everything that happens next summer, because that decision he makes is the one that I think will have a lot of ripple effects for everybody else in terms of not just how good Oklahoma City is in the West, but also what these other guys think about in terms of real options they have to be competitive. By the way, this is also why it's so frustrating that none of the Eastern Conference teams, most notably the Knicks, didn't manage this circumstance well enough to keep space for this year, because if they had, that would have been a way easier pitch because you wouldn't have to face the Warriors until the NBA Finals. Yep, you're totally right. And, you know, it does... There, there is an opening too. I mean, you look at like to me, the team to watch this year are the Wizards. Like, if the Wizards could somehow say get Demarcus Cousins on their team and have a trio of Wall, Beal, and Boogie, like that's a team that you could see getting to the finals. And of like of all those teams in that upper reaches of the East, I think they're the one team that has the the ability if they can find the right piece to really go toe to toe with Cleveland right now. And that's where, like you, you just met, like, I just thought of that because the way you frame the, your statement, like it is, it is kind of remarkable that a lot of these teams are just stuck in a position where they need either to have this space to go get a couple guys, or they have to have the space to get that one guy. And because of stuff they've done over the last year or two, none of those teams are really in a position to really strike rich uh, if the opportunity presents itself next summer or before. Along those lines, question that I'm looking at in the East is, will the rising teams start passing the older teams? Like, will the, the, so basically to me, the rising teams are the Sixers, 
the Bucks, and to a lesser point, I don't know where the Celtics fit in anymore. The Celtics are in their own thing. They're they're kind of both at the same time, which is why I don't like it. And then right. will the versus like the Raptors? Eh, the Wizards are young enough that they're kind of they're yeah. They're, the Wizards, I don't think. I think the Wizards yeah. and Celtics are kind of in their own thing. They're both. Yeah. They both should be. Very good for like quite young, a while. They're you young, look at their and, young and still good. So yeah, really, right. So so where does where do those balances strike? And so are, are those teams like the Bucks and the Sixers? Are they good enough where we're saying like if LeBron leaves Cleveland, that's where the conference is going? Or do we say the Wizards and Celtics are going to battle it out for a couple of years while they get ready? I mean, to me, I think it's the latter. I, I just I love Philadelphia's long term potential, but there's just so many question marks there. Marco Fultz hasn't played a game yet. Ben Simmons hasn't played a game yet. Joel Embiid, you know, we spent five or ten minutes talking about him. In fact, you can't ever trust him to play at all. I, I just think you look around at those guys, and it's to me, it's just very difficult to guarantee they're going to be able to play. So, you know, and I think, and I obviously Giannis has a chance to be the best player in the league. I think he probably will win one or more MVPs at some point. So he might be good enough to lift the Bucks up, but I just don't know if they have enough there. That's where the Jabari thing kills you because Jabari could be a really good second scorer on a team like that and could be kind of a difference maker. But with two torn ACLs, it's just hard for me to think he's going to be able to hold up. And maybe he just never does it again, and he's great. But, I mean, two torn ACLs in the span of, what, three years? That's pretty tough to come back from. So, you know, I think both of those teams, you know, I think have the potential to become a real factor in the East, but they've got a lot of structural issues they got to figure out in order to figure out exactly where they stand because you know what Boston and Washington are, and both those teams still have the ability to add a piece or two. Things break right, I think, but... But you look at you look at teams like Philly and, and Milwaukee, and while Philly can still add guys, both of them have such big injury questions going forward that I think it's going to be difficult to know exactly where everything stands. Totally fair. And with the Sixers, you can make an argument that looking there's a way to look good and lose a lot that might actually be the best case for them since they have their own pick. Where they, you know, they show signs, but that it still takes them a little bit. And that's actually where I think they might be just because of A, so much turnover and B, so many guys that just do not have experience. But if Embiid can actually play, their defense was solid when he was on the floor last year. They added Amir. I, 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 there's basically, I see both sides of the Sixers. I see a way that it could work and then I see a way that it could take more time. And that's also why the Bucks are more interesting. So in some ways to me is because. I could see, you know, if Giannis takes another step, if their young guys look better, if they thon playing Thon Maker more regularly really helps him, that they get into this mix too. And I, it's going to be so much fun to watch. I'm really looking forward to this season. Yeah, no, me too. It's going to be great. And like you said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reason to be excited about the upcoming year for sure. And you know, all the, all the above or some of them plus more. I mean, it's, it's going to be a great season and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see what, uh, to see what happens. It's, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, you know, for, for guys like us who live to watch the NBA every day, there's going to be something to watch every day, which, uh, which makes it a pretty good job to have. Absolutely. Thanks so much for taking the time. Sure, man. Happy to do it. Thanks again to Tim Bontemps for taking the time to come on. You can, of course, read him at the Washington Post, and you can follow him on Twitter at Tim Bontemps. That's T-I-M-B-O-N-T-E-M-P-S. He had two pieces. We didn't really talk about this in the course of it, mostly because I hadn't read them when we recorded it, on the, the Top 100 Players, which is a feature he did as well last year, and two companion pieces with that. And then also, he worked on a piece with David Farenthold, which is awesome, about what's going on in sports in terms of Trump hotels and everything political. And so it was, I, I thought it was an interesting juxtaposition to have those two things come out at the same day, actually. I think it was within a couple hours. And Tim does phenomenal work. And you can also listen to the posting up podcast that he does, which I enjoy, was actually on, uh, continuing my weird trend of talking about the Orlando Magic on podcasts, I, which I actually do enjoy because I watch them a lot and think about them a fair amount. So you can definitely check that out as well, whether I'm on it or not. It's it's really good stuff. And we're getting close to the start of the season. I have actually recorded the next Real Jam Radio. It's with Sirat Sohi. We were originally going to do this as two parts of the same episode, but then Tim and I talked for more than an hour. Sirat and I talked for more than an hour. So that's going to be this week and then next week, and then I'll have something else for the week after that. And that's a fun conversation too. So you can afford that. Dunked On is going strong now. We're 
about to start the season. Nate and I have been prepping our season preview and doing newsers and things like that, and he's been finishing up his off-season work, and we're going to be going. And then, of course, the Twitter NBA show is going to start Wednesday, so the second day of the NBA season. We're going to be tackling the national games then and going probably about once a week with that. And then my writing work is going to be with everyone. I, I have new pieces up for Real GM, added a CBA encyclopedia piece on rookie scale extensions, which have been very relevant in the last week or two. And then work for the Sporting News, writing for The Athletic. And yeah, it's a, lo- a lot of fun, interesting things to work on. And then, of course, my book, 100 Things Warriors Fans Should Know and Do Before They Die. It is technically released on November 1st, but people are getting copies as early as now. I got a few tweets and DMs and Facebook messages today that people are getting it, which is really exciting. I mean, it's something that I've been working on for such a long time. And to really see it come to fruition in that way is very thrilling. And so you can check that out. You can buy it really wherever, hopefully wherever books are sold. And if they don't have it, you can find it other places. You can always reach out to me. And it's it's so much fun to, to think about that something like that with, with more permanence as much as I love my other written work. So you can check that out. If you want to support me, you can also check out the Warriors Watch podcast, which I just launched. That is with CLNS Radio or CLNS Media that's rebranded, which is also what Real GM Radio is with. You can check them out. And it's going to be probably once or twice a week in whatever form I want talking about the Warriors. So some interviews, some game recaps, some solo stuff. And podcast is already out with Anthony Slater talking about China and everything like that. So and I did some Vegas odd stuff. So going in a lot of different directions with that, I have complete control over the direction. So that's really exciting. So if you want to support me, you can check that show out too. Leave rating, leave review, same things you can do here. And then the big thing also for me beyond subscribing, downloading every episode, which are great with my stuff because it's more sporadic than something like Dunked On, is to check out our sponsors. Because if you check out our sponsors, they know that you came from us. That not only leads them to want to advertise more with us, but that leads other people to want to advertise more with us. So for this episode that is great awesome shoes have a pair absolutely love them g-r-e-a-t-s dot com real gm promo code gives you 15 percent off and if you don't like the shoes you get you get free shipping and free returns so you can check it out the ones i got first try fit perfectly was very happy about that and then blue apron food delivery awesome meals blueapron.com slash real gm three meals for free including free shipping on your first order should definitely check it out if you haven't already i feel a little bit bad if you haven't already tried it out i've been impassioned pitching them for years now and i I do really absolutely love their product so you can check that out if you have any feedback on the show good bad or indifferent danny larue nba at gmail.com is the single best way you can try at danny larue on twitter but my mentions are pretty consistently busy but on email you can write as long as you want and if you take the time to write it I will take the time to read it. I do take it to heart. And whether it's praise or it's criticism or whatever, I do really appreciate that. So thank you so much for listening. Take care and make it a great day.